Good morning, everyone, and welcome to White Branch this morning. Uh, we're going to start our service off with some opening music. We're going to sing the family of God. Who believe 
That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills everything in every way. Open the eyes of my heart. I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet of those like a bear and the mouth of, of that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and the throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. Had been healed. The whole the whole wide world was astonished and followed the beast. Men worshipped this dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they have worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like this beast? Who can make war against him? The beast was given the mouth to, to other proud words and blasphemies to, and to exercise his authority for 42 months. Okay, how many years are 42 months? Okay. He opened his mouth and to blaspheme God and the slander of his name and his dwelling place into oak and to those who live in heaven. And he was and he was given power to make war against all the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth who worship the beast. All those names who have not been written in the book belonging to the lamb that was slain from the, crea slain from the creation of this world. He who has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity he will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword, he will be killed. This calls for the patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. Good job, good job. Yep. Thank you. I said I'm trying to work some more people into the scripture readings, and Davin was the first one to volunteer. He heard that last week, and he was ready to go. So. I've had some volunteer the other way, 
I had a few tell me last week, don't ask me. <laughs> so I'll try to keep that in mind as well. But I would like to get a variety of people uh, to share in the scripture reading. I think that'd be helpful. And give an opportunity to hear from other people and participate in our worship together. So I'll start off uh, sharing this story with you. So two boys were walking through the woods looking for walnuts. Along the way, they filled their buckets, shirts, pockets, whatever else they could find. When they could hold no more nuts, they started down the country road until they came to the cemetery. And the boys decided this was a good place to stop and divide the nuts. And they sat in the shade behind a large tree, and they dumped all their nuts into a pile and began to divide them. One for you, one for me. One for you, one for me. And then another boy passing by happened to hear them, but he couldn't see them because they were behind the tree. And he ran away, and he got his dad and said, Quick, quick, come here. And what's wrong, his father asked. I can't explain now. Just come on, hurry. And his father came down the road with him, and he said, Do you hear that? Without seeing, they heard again, One for me, one for you. One for me, one for you. The devil and the Lord dividing the souls, Dad. The father, skeptical, said, Well, I don't think so, son. But then they heard. Now, as soon as we get those two nuts down by the road, we'll have them all in. <laughs> we'll eventually get into talking about dividing uh, here today, so I thought that might be a good story to start with. But we're continuing our series of Revelation, and we're in Revelation 13, and I'm kind of sort of going backwards, uh, but, you know, kind of just taking it as I feel we're supposed to do this. It's a little different way maybe of going through Revelation. John had a series of Revelations, and he wrote them down, and this is helpful for the church. A lot of it, I believe, is future. But just like the Old Testament, we can look in the past, and we can say we're not currently living under the Old Covenant. We're not currently living in Israel. This isn't where we directly live. We can find things to apply to our lives from it. I think even though a lot of this may be future, we can look at themes and we can look at things that apply in every generation. And I want us to think about that again today. How can this apply in our generation, even though this is future in terms of what we're looking at? And then I want you to see again the connection with last week. Last week, Revelation 12, we talked about the spiritual war. That there is a spiritual war going on between Satan and those on the side of evil and God and those on the side of good. And Satan, I believe, has a three-pronged strategy or three main things that he tries to do, I believe, in every generation. I believe that will culminate in a final three and a half years or a final 42 months in one final individual who is an antichrist and another final individual who is a false prophet and one final time of persecution. But I believe that those three are the strategies he uses in every generation. Persecution of God's people, false prophets and teachers from the religious side, and political leaders from the political side. And I want you to see that as we get into this now. Let's go to Satan's strategy number one, persecute God's people. And we see here Revelation 13, verse 10. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity he will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword he will be killed. And now look at this line. This calls for patient endurance patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints in other words when you're facing persecution it takes patient endurance and faithfulness to endure it so the word patient in our culture is often meant i just need to wait i have something i really want but i need to wait and so in our culture we're not very good at that part we're used to, this is what I want, this is when I want it, and I hate waiting. And we kind of trained ourselves in this culture for that. And I always say the best place you learn that is in the doctor's office, and that's why they call you patients. <laughs> <laughs> Hurry up and wait. You better not be late. You have to be early when you arrive, and then what do you do when you get there? You wait. And then they take you in, talk a little bit with the nurse, and then you wait. And then the doctor comes, and then you wait. And then you get released. And then you wait for results. <laughs> a lot of waiting. Patience, right? That's why we're called patience. But when we look here, this word patience, and it might even be in 
in some other versions. But oftentimes, King James, for example, will translate patience as long-suffering. Because biblically, patience equates long-suffering. And none of us likes suffering at all, let alone long-suffering. But he is telling God's people, you have to be ready for long suffering, patient endurance, faithfulness. Look at Revelation 14, 12. We see almost the exact same words in Revelation 14, 12. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. Now, every generation, I believe, needs to face this. I want to start out by saying something because the first century church was a persecuted church. We have to remember the entire New Testament was written by and for a persecuted church. Keep that in mind. The entire New Testament was written by and for a persecuted church. They were not the majority, they were not the ones in power, they were the minority, and they were getting persecuted from their Jewish brothers and sisters if they were Jewish, by the Gentiles if they were Gentiles, by the Romans because they ruled the entire area. So it was written by and for a persecuted church. It was not until Constantine in the 300s when he became a Christian who was a Roman emperor. Until then, every emperor was against Christianity. Constantine became a Christian and made Christianity the favored religion. Two emperors later, Theodosius made it the demanded state religion. And Rome was officially Christian from that time forward. And from the 300s until even now, the West, where we have lived, Europe and on into America, has primarily been Christian dominated. We have been the ones more in power. We've been the ones more in control. We've been the ones more free, especially in America where we have freedom of religious expression and freedom of worship and persecution has not been something we have faced very often in America. So we are living in a day and age where we're looking at this and saying it doesn't quite compute. But I want to read something from the Church of the Brethren. August 3rd, 2022, on our Newsline feed, the website, where they give updates of different things going on in the Church of the Brethren. You have heard of our brothers and sisters in Nigeria. And this is just this past week. Killings, kidnapping, and ransacking of communities continue across Nigeria, according to a recent update from Zachariah Musa, head of the Ecclesia Yanawa in Nigeria, Church of the Brethren in Nigeria. This is what they're facing right now. So you can see this is not something, oh, they just did dealt with that in the first century, and oh, yeah, they'll deal with that in the last 42 months, but we're not dealing with it now. Tell the EYN we're not dealing with this right now. They know they're dealing with this right now. Every generation has to face this. Thankfully, in America, we have not had to. Will we never have to? I'm not going to guarantee that. In fact, part of my purpose in this series is to get us ready for these types of things. Because if Satan can, he will certainly bring this type of stuff to America. So we need to be at least aware of that, aware of these possibilities, and recognizing our brothers and sisters right now in Nigeria are facing this. And later on it says uh, about other people who were kidnapped, and then another EYN pastor received a threatening letter from unknown criminal elements demanding money or he would be kidnapped. And then Musa requested that the U.S. church continue praying for Nigeria. So I think we need to do that. We have our brothers and sisters in Nigeria saying, pray for us. Pray for us to have patient endurance. Pray for us to be faithful. And so this is part of what we are called to be as the body of Christ. To recognize this is going on right now in our world with our brothers and sisters who hours ago, because they're on the eastern half, right? They've already had their Sunday worship. But hours ago, in the midst of persecution, they gathered for worship. 
Hours ago, in the midst of threats, they gathered for worship. And they are the ones displaying for us what it means to have patient endurance and faithfulness in the midst of hardship. So in Revelation 6, and I quoted this before in the fifth seal, and we'll get into these seals eventually. Seals are one of my favorite animals, by the way. <laughs> these are not those kind of seals. <laughs> these are seals on a paper. But maybe that's why I don't like orcas. Right? Orcas eat seals. All right. So, Revelation 6, 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. And they called out in a loud voice, verse 10, How long? So we see here at the opening of this fifth seal, there's this cry. How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you do what? You judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. I'm going to go to verse 11 and come back to verse 10. 11, that each of them was given a white robe, and they were told, wait a little longer. What no one wants to hear. When you really want something, the last thing you want to hear is, wait a little longer. We know that just from our fleshly desires, right? You want something, wait a little longer. We don't like that. Our kids want something, we say, wait a little longer. They don't like that. But especially when you're suffering persecution and you cry out to your God and you say, how long, Lord? And he says, wait a little longer. Boy, that's hard to hear. Wait a little longer until the number of the fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. So there's three things here, I believe, that really help us from this one section. Show us what Revelation helps us see. I'm always looking for what's the main point, what's the main thread in this book when I'm reading the Bible. I believe this is one of them. One is persecution of God's people. It's going on when it was written. It will continue on in intense form at the end and right on until then. Secondly, back to verse 10. How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth? One of the second main threads of Revelation is God judging the earth. And one of the third one is because of this, avenging our blood. So God is going to judge and then he's going to be a warrior and avenge the blood of his people. But for a little while, he lets them get defeated. For a little while, he lets them get killed. For a little while, it looks like they're losing until he turns it all around and he judges and avenges those who have gone against him and his people. So the first one, the strategy of Satan, is to persecute God's people. Apply as much pressure as he can and make it as hard as he can so the people of God get weak. And we need to pray for grace to stand firm. We need to pray for grace to be strong. I would love to stand here today and say, I'm going to be strong for the Lord no matter what comes my way. I am standing for him. But I've learned from the example of Peter not to do that. Not this Peter. <laughs> the Bible Peter. Because what happened with Peter? On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he looked at Peter, and he said, before the rooster crows three times tonight, you're going to deny you know me. Not me. Even if everyone else falls away, I'll stand with you, Jesus. And then Jesus got arrested. And then Jesus was on trial. And then they said, you were one of them too. And he said, I don't know the man. Denial. I don't know the man. Denial. I don't know the man. Denial. I would love to say I'm going to be strong and boast in my ability to stand for Jesus. But Peter did that. And guess what happened? When the pressure came and his life was on the line, three times he said, I don't know the man. So I'm praying for grace. I'm encouraging you to do the same, that if your pressure is applied, you're able to stand for Jesus. Now, this happens in small ways in our culture right now. In small ways, people are putting pressure on us to try to not stand for Jesus or not declare the truth or not share the gospel, not be open about our faith, to back off from what we believe. But around the world, it's more than a little pressure like we see in Nigeria, like we see in some of these Muslim countries, like we see in China and some of these other places. 
where the church literally had to meet underground today and not let the government know where they were meeting. Now, um, to the first beast. Let's go to the first beast, Revelation 13, verse 1. And the dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw the beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns, seven heads, ten crowns on his head, and each head had a blasphemous name. I know there's a lot of imagery. But here's what's happening. We see a unity forming. A unity forming around this king and his kingdom. And unity is good when it's for the good reason, but unity is bad when it's against God and his kingdom. And we have to recognize sometimes division can be a good thing. Because if one group is standing against God and one group is standing for God, we don't want to get rid of standing for God in order to have unity. But we see this unity, the seven heads, the ten crowns, the ten horns. And verse 2, Then I saw a beast resembled a leopard, but it had feet like a bear, mouth like a lion. So we see again a coming together. If you go back to Revelation or Daniel chapter 7, I want to show you where these images come from. Daniel chapter 7, 3 through 8. Some things in the Bible, if you read the Bible more, or you find people pointing you in the right direction, you can see things in the Bible that relate to other parts of the Bible, and it helps. So Revelation 7, verse 3, and it doesn't explain who's what in this, in this part of Scripture, but we at least see that there is beasts, and we see images. Verse 3, four great beasts came up out of the sea. Very similar revelation, right? Beasts coming out of the sea. Now we see in verse 3, four great beasts each different from the other. Verse 4, the first was like a lion. So there's the lion imagery, right? Verse 5, every form was a second beast. It looked like a bear. All right? Verse 6, after that I looked, and every form was another beast. It looked like a leopard. <coughs> Too bad it wasn't a tiger, right? Then we could have had Wizard of Oz. <laughs> The lion and tiger and bear. Oh, my. All right? <laughs> Instead, it's a lion, a leopard, and a bear. But point being, the lion, the leopard, and the bear come together. So each of those in Daniel's day represented different kingdoms, a succession of kingdoms of Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. And here we see almost like a combination of Babylon, Amida, Persia, and Greece. A unity, a unifying, a coming together. And the mouth like that of a lion, the dragon gave the beast his power and his throne. Now we see very clearly this beast is backed by Satan. This Antichrist is backed by Satan. And he gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And verse 3, one of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound. But the fatal wound had been healed. This could have been speaking of a kingdom or a king. A group or an individual. I'm going to go with the individual, but it could be either. This is a miraculous comeback. A death and resurrection of sorts. A miraculous healing of sorts. The whole world then was astonished and followed the beast. So this, whatever this is, astonishes the world. That's why I believe it's a miraculous event to one individual. Astonishes the world, and then they want to follow this person. Verse 4. Now here, again, out of verse 13, I talked about the fifth seal being key to the book of Revelation. What's key to this chapter? This verse. 13.4. It's all about worship. All of life is about worship. Who or what do you worship? Verse 4. Men worship the dragon. That's bad. Who's the dragon? Satan. This is satanic worship. They are worshiping Satan. Because he had given authority to the beast and they also worshiped the beast. So they worship Satan and they worship this person who's an antichrist figure, not the true Christ. And by worshiping him, they have turned away from worshiping God. And if you know the first two commandments, this should be pretty clear. Commandment one, you shall worship the Lord your God. <laughs> you shall have no other gods before or besides me. One God, 
don't worship anyone else. And the second one, you shall have no images or idols before me. We'll talk about the image or the idol here in a minute. But they asked, who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? So these people are worshiping this person and this false system. And the beast then was so proud. Look at verse 5. Given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. And he opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. So this is against Jesus and against God and against his kingdom. And he's proud and he's boastful. In verse 7, he was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And it's so hard to read. Why, God, are you giving this power to the Antichrist to conquer your people? To make war and conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. Look at verse 8. All the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. But then we see this. All whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the Lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. So there's a group of people who won't. But anybody who's not written in the Lamb's book of life is going to turn and worship this beast. Now he who has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, ten, into captivity he will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword he'll be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. Now eleven. So let me back up for just a minute. That first beast, we see Antichrist. We see political leadership. We see authority. We see miraculous comeback. A, com- a coming together of multiple beasts. Maybe the literal areas of Greece and Medo-Persia and Babylon, which would be Eastern Europe, Iraq, Iran, that area. But we see a, a unity. Now, second, we see a second beast, 11, coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb. He looks like a good person. He looks like Jesus, like a lamb. But he speaks like a dragon. There is a hypocrisy there. It looks like a great religious leader, but it's not. Twelve, he exercised all the authority of the first beast on his behalf and made the earth, what did he do, and its inhabitants worship the first beast. What's his goal? To get people to worship the beast. So he is a false prophet, a false teacher, a false religious leader who leads people to worship the beast. 13, and he performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven in full view of men. Now, who did that in the Old Testament? It was the prophet Elijah. Elijah had the false prophets line up, prophets of Baal, said, see if you can call down fire from heaven. And they did everything they could. They started slashing themselves and cutting themselves and crying out. They had hours and hours and no fire. Elijah mocks them. And then finally he says here, build a fire, but put water and water and water and water and water. So there's no way I can get a fire unless it's supernatural. He calls it down, fire comes down, consumes it. The true prophet called down fire from heaven. The false prophets could not. Here it's the exact opposite. We see these false prophets. This false prophet, this final false prophet, called down fire from heaven, performing miraculous signs, I believe, on the beast. I believe creating that miracle of healing, that miracle of comeback, that miracle of resurrection, whatever it may be, for that person to come back to life, performing all kinds of miraculous signs and wonders. 14, because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. And it's a great deception. But what does he do with it? He ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. He sets up the image. Now we already mentioned Daniel. Think back at Daniel. What happens in Daniel? Nebuchadnezzar sets up an image and you must fall down and worship when you hear the music play. But there's three people who don't. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, what happens to them? They get thrown into the fiery furnace. Why? Because they don't worship the image. 
Daniel's told, you can't pray to your God. What does he do? He kneels down, he keeps praying to his God. He doesn't do the false worship. He doesn't worship the way that the Babylonians do. He gets thrown into a den of lions. Now, thankfully, they all get protected and pulled out. At this time, it doesn't look like God's people do. <laughs> Looks like they actually get killed. Looks like they actually get put to the sword. But regardless, I want you to see here, it should be very clear and obvious. An image, an idol, a false thing to worship. 15. He was given power to give breath to the image and the first beast so it could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. Worship's always the key issue. And in every generation, we have to make a decision who or what will we worship. Are we going to worship Jesus or are we going to worship something else? Are we going to worship Jesus or are we going to worship someone else? We have a choice to make. And in these last 42 months, I believe it's God's last separation of all humanity into one of two categories. Worship me, worship the beast. Everybody's going to choose one or the other. So when God comes back to judge the earth, when he comes in person, everybody has made their decision who they're worshiping. And it'll be obvious. One reason, they will have worshiped the beast. Second reason, they'll have a mark. Verse 16, he also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, 17, so no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. You can see now why these last couple of years made some people nervous. <laughs> You mean I need to do that or I can't participate? You mean I need to do that or I can't engage? See, these are tactics of saying conform or die. It's an antichrist spirit of trying to say you have to do what I tell you. You have to follow the dictator. And we see this throughout history when dictators gain control and then they say, oh, if you're not going to conform, then your life is on the line. So we see here when Jesus returns, it'll be clear. Having the mark was good for 42 months. It gave you access. It allowed you to buy and sell. You could participate. You had your provision. Short-term gain, as I said a couple weeks ago. The long-term pain is going to be when Jesus returns and you've got that mark, it's saying, I've worshipped the beast, I've worshipped Satan, and I've gone against you, Jesus. So it'll be clear for judgment time. And you got the mark. You worshipped Satan. You chose short-term gain. And now you're going to get your eternal judgment. On the flip side, those who refused it, short-term pain going to suffer, but when Jesus returns, long-term gain. Now you get to enjoy the benefit of being with Jesus forever. And he says, now this calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast. His man's number is number 666. There's where that number comes from. That's why everyone hates it when they go to the store and it costs 666, right? If gas price is ever 666, we're in trouble, right? <laughs> Permanent gas price, 666. I, I don't know all the details of why we have this number, but I do know man, God's number is 777, man's number is 666. I know in the early Greek they thought Emperor Nero kind of fits 666 in the Greek. There's different ways of calculating. I'm not going to get into all that, but I am going to say that if you're going to choose something, Against the things of God, don't do it. You'll have the wisdom, the grace, the insight to understand in every generation we need to choose to worship Jesus and not go against him. Whatever political pressure comes, whatever religious leaders say, whatever pressure you might feel from your friends or family, pray for the grace to say yes to Jesus and worship him and not go the other way. 
And then these last three and a half years, there's going to be an intense pressure like never before. And God will use those last three and a half years so everybody makes a clear decision for or against him. So when he comes to judge the world, there will be nobody who can say, I was in the middle, I didn't know, I wasn't sure. It'll be clear. So his judgment will be absolutely just at that point. Absolutely, essentially clear. Mark or Jesus. Worship the beast, worship Jesus. Everybody will be on one side or the other by the time he returns. No middle ground. So here's my challenges for us. Number one, read the supporting scriptures. I've got supporting scriptures in the back. There's a whole lot more I would have liked to have said. You're thinking, oh, Lord. <laughs> now, there's a lot more I would have loved to have said. It's all on the back. Read those scriptures. Supporting scriptures for each of the things that I talked about today. Secondly, read the Bible every day. So you can identify what? Truth over deception. Deception comes when we don't know truth. If we know truth, we won't be deceived. John 8, what did Jesus say? If you continue in my word, you'll know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Three, pray for God's grace to go God's way. And not the way of antichrists and false prophets and false teachers. Pray for God's grace. And then fourthly, let's pray for and support God's people who are being persecuted in our generation. Like these Nigerian brothers and sisters. I should have wrote this down, but I didn't. You can also look up Voice of the Martyrs. They're another great organization that supports the persecuted church around the world. So let's pray together. God, we come to you now in the name of Jesus. We recognize that we have a real enemy out there. There's a real demonic realm. And he wants to sway us away from worshiping you. Or make us feel pressure, make it feel hard to worship you. To make us feel like we don't want to worship Jesus. To make it look like going another way would be a better way. But God, help us to think through truth. Help us to think through the long-term gain, the long-term benefit of following you, Lord. And God, we want to lift up our brothers and sisters today who face danger and persecution for worshiping you those around the world and countries that it's very difficult and challenging to worship you, God. We pray for them today. We pray for grace upon them. We pray for strength upon them. We pray for patience and endurance and strength and faithfulness, God. Even when their family and friends and the government and other religious leaders tell them they're wrong, God, help them to stand for truth. And God, I pray now for us here in our situations that you'll give us the grace to stand. Give us the grace to believe. Give us the grace to stand for truth. God, we're not strong in ourselves. I don't want to be like Peter proclaiming a false sense of ability. God, we need your grace to do what you've called us to. And I pray if anyone here or online wants to make that decision today, I want to say, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. Forgive my sin. I want to worship you. Give me your grace today. Help me to follow you the rest of my life. I want to live with you in your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen. Have our worship team come up and lead us now in our final song. Would you please all stand with me? We're going to sing in Christ alone.
today by the Holy Spirit to stand for Jesus in whatever way he calls you to stand and to worship him and him alone. May God bless you. Mm -hmm.